Well, welcome to today's uh, update thinking on the novel coronavirus of 2019. Now, today I want to give you a, a quick update on a few things that are happening and a few numbers. And then we want to look in a little more detail at the, the mechanisms of spread. I've had quite a lot of questions on this, the mechanisms of spread. And there's a couple of new things I've learned that I want to share with you as well on how this spreads, particularly thinking about how long the virus can live on surfaces. So I've just started, watched a, a video from Wuhan in China and there's a like a fire engine thing going down the street, spraying out disinfectant. And to me, that is clearly because they're worried about the virus living on surfaces. So we'll look at a little bit of uh, research on that because on this channel, of course, we need to be evidence-based. Right. Um, before I start, an apology for yesterday. Yesterday I said the influenza uh, genetic material was DNA. I know I horrified quite a few of you. Of course, it's not. It's RNA. And in fact, it's an important difference because the RNA and the coronavirus are both single-stranded RNA viruses, ribonucleic acid viruses. And that means if there's a mistake in the single strand of RNA, there's not a duplicate strand like there is in DNA in the deoxyribonucleic acid to repair it. So that means mistakes can occur more. Well, the, the mistakes can occur just as easily, but they can't be repaired. So the end result is that there could be changes in the genetic information in the RNA. And we'll call that a mutation. And uh, that could be significant. A mutation could potentially increase the, the uh, virulence, the pathogenicity, uh, how bad it is, how severe the disease is. And of course, it could also increase the, uh, the transmissibility potentially. So it is an important difference. Anyway, on to today's news. Uh, Wednesday, February the 5th. Um, confirmed cases, just checked on the Johns Hopkins website, 24,200. 24,622 confirmed deaths, uh, 494, 1,028 recovered. Now in, uh, in 27 countries, I've got one or more cases of this. Now, I've been following this in detail for, uh, well, since it started really. And um, well, basically I've come to the conclusion that this is going to become a pandemic. So at the moment, it's an epidemic. An epidemic is a localised widespread outbreak. If you count China as localised, it's a pretty big place. But the epidemic is, is all over China now. From what we've learnt about asymptomatic carriers spreading the disease, from what, what we've learnt about the uh, potential spread in the incubation period, from what we've learnt about the, uh, the virus living on for a period of time after someone's feeling better, um, they're not a good combination of uh, circumstances. And what I think is going to happen, as we mentioned on previous videos, is this uh, virus will become established <clears throat> in, a, in a country which has a, a poorly developed healthcare assist system. So I think it will become established uh, in a poorer country, a less an economically developed country. And there'll be uh, clusters in, in cities in poorer countries where the healthcare system is not able to mobilise and there's not enough healthcare system there to isolate the patients they have. That will give rise to large clusters in various uh, cities in poorer countries. And from there, it, it is going to spread because there'll be very large numbers of the disease. Now, we don't know how severe it is yet. We're hoping that most cases are mild. But without being alarmist, uh, it's, I believe that, that this disease is coming to my country and will probably be coming to, to yours. Um, th th that's, my, that's my view from, from the data so far. Now, I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. Uh, it's bad enough already, but we're going to see. Now, the Lancet, the 31st uh, article, 31st of January, estimated infection rates from their modelling on the 25th of January was, was 75,000. And we've said this before, this is based on their modelling. But I haven't seen a more up-to-date estimate yet. And of course, in this channel, on these programmes, we always want to be evidence-based. So this is in the peer-reviewed literature. And at the moment, I'm not in a position to add to that because I haven't read and have been looking. <laughs> I haven't read anything 
uh, that that is more up to date than that. And likewise with the doubling time, uh, the, the BBC News in my country is saying five days, but I can't find the original source for that, whereas this is a, a peer-reviewed journal article. So until I get more peer-reviewed information, I'm sticking with the 6.4 days. This could mean that there's this kind of... Uh, this kind of spread, so if there's 300,000 cases, 2% mortality. We are indeed looking at a human tragedy and uh, more possibility of uh, more possibility of spread. Oops. Now, um, <clears throat> next thing I wanted to mention was the World Health Organization. They've just asked for $500 million for research into the virus, which of course is wonderful. I hope they get it. Um, we really need to get on top of viral infections. I mean, we're just in the Middle Ages in a lot of ways as far as viral infections is concerned. Antiviral drugs are very limited. We have antiviral drugs for HIV that keep, that keep the virus at bay. We have some antiviral drugs for um, herpes simplex virus and uh, other herpes viruses. But antiviral therapy is uh, basic, to put it at best. We still have no known effective antiviral drug for this novel coronavirus. So in the light of that, the, the WHO guidelines, I must say, I'm, I'm somewhat surprised. Um, you know, they're still saying carry on traveling. Um, th they're not saying uh, don't travel to China, that they're saying carry on cross-border trade. Um, I can understand they want to do that for economic reasons, but from a healthcare point of view, I must say I'm, I'm somewhat bemused by their um, by their approach. Not that it's for me to tell the World Health Organization organize, organization what to do, um, but I am somewhat puzzled by it. I must say uh, I think it needs to be a more vigorous response. Personally, but that's just me. Now. Um, 3,700 people on a cruise ship uh, for 14 days in Japan after 10 people were tested positive. Um, so they're stuck in their cabins. Now, that's awful being stuck in your cabin for 14 days. I mean, these are boring enough at the best of times. But um, in a sense, that's encouraging because if they're in the cabins, if there is one or two more cases, which there may well be on the ship, that they'll be isolated and hopefully won't spread it around the whole of the ship. So in a sense, that's good, although it is a, an unfortunate, almost a custodial sentence for these people. But there's no choice but to do that. <coughs> and um, the BBC have just told me there's 1,871 passengers on the World Dream, which is another cruise liner. And these cruise liners have just about as many. Um, I'm sure there'd be another thousand members of the crew on top of that being tested in Hong Kong. And... Um, my government has just said that all British people should leave China. You know, not just Wuhan, all of China. That, that, that's what they're currently saying. Now, questions I've been slightly worried about today is um, I heard about a neonatal case, which I'll talk to you in about a minute. But that brought into my mind the possibility of teratogenesis. And we know there was some teratogenesis with the... Uh, with the 2003-2004 uh, outbreak of, uh, of the other coronavirus, of SARS. Um, so we know that there might be some... Well, with those ter teratogenesis with this other virus, we're not sure about this one. We simply don't know. Teratogenesis means, not SARS, SARS, sorry, the, the outbreak of SARS in 2004. There, there was some... Uh, teratogenic effects. Now, teratogenesis is, uh, terato is the formation of the fetus, genesis is beginning. So ter a teratogen is, is anything that can cause abnormal fetal development. And, and with SARS, there was some element of that. Um, no evidence at all that there is with this novel coronavirus, so I'm hoping there's not, but that's a bit of a concern at the moment. And I did hear about a 30-hour-old baby that tragically uh, was diagnosed with this condition in China. Um, it looks like he probably caught it from his mother. More of that in a minute. But the, the all I know is this: this uh, this neonate, this newborn baby who got the disease thirty hours after birth in China, is that his observations are stable, which, which is very good, of course. And we don't really know how severe 
the new novel coronavirus is in children. But SARS was also a coronavirus, which we're taking some information from. We can't extrapolate directly. But in SARS, people that were less than 12 years of age generally had a milder disease. So given that SARS was a milder disease in children and babies, I'm really hoping that the same is true of the novel coronavirus. And I'm also hoping there's not going to be teratogenic effects, but there were some with with uh, with SARS unknowns we, we simply don't know at the moment mechanism spread I just want to go over this now uh, droplet infection into the air within uh, two meters of someone there's a possibility of droplet infection especially if they're coughing coughs and sneezes spread diseases droplets to surface and mucous membranes so here the the virus can go onto a surface from the droplets in someone's breath goes onto the hand, doesn't get through the skin in the hand, but gets to the mucous membranes if you're fiddling with your eyes. And studies have shown that people do this an awful lot without, just without realising it. Something to really bear in mind if the virus comes to your area. Skin to skin, so I've no doubt that a handshake would, would spread it. And faecal oral is, is uh, definitely a mode of spread. Now we looked at this from the first case in America that the faeces of, of the, the, the uh, young chap in America who had it was uh, infected with the virus. <coughs> so that, that's true. <clears throat> and I was actually reading a fascinating paper earlier today that said um, if you uh, use a toilet, you defecate into the toilet, then flush the chain, then that can cause aerosolization. There can be wafting of the virus up into the air that could be potentially breathed into a mucous membrane or get into the eyes, or more likely would go onto a surface which will then be touched by someone else. So meticulous personal hygiene after using public toilets, very thorough hand cleaning is going to be important. And if you put the lid down on the toilet before you flush, then that's going to contain the aerosolization. But of course you don't know if the person before you has done that, so if there is a lot of this virus about, if it becomes endemic, um, beware of aerosolization from toilets, from toilet flushing, and the possibility of the virus getting onto a surface near the toilet and then from the surface onto someone's hands and then onto someone's mucous membranes. Now, given that it's transmitted by mucous membranes, I haven't membranes, I haven't read this, but there's quite a few, there's quite a few things. They can't get through the skin. There's a lot of diseases can't get through the intact skin, but they could get through a cut or a graze potentially. So that, that's another possible mode of spread, I would imagine. But things that can't get through the intact skin, like this virus, can get through mucous membranes. And of course, the genital mucosa is, is a mucous membrane. So I'll be very surprised if this wasn't spread by uh, sex. And given that the virus is in saliva, I think it goes without saying that kissing would be a cause of, a cause of spread. And with this 30 hour old baby in China getting the condition, that makes people wonder, including myself, whether it can be transmitted from the mother to the baby because the mother was positive. This is what we call vertical transmission. It goes from the mother down to the baby. So it looks unfortunately like that may be occurring, but we're hoping, as appears to be the case with this baby that we know of in China, like SARS, we're hoping it's less severe in children because we know SARS is and we know that SARS and novel coronavirus are, are both a, a coronavirus. Now, um, the main topic in today's uh, update is information I've gained about uh, surface survival. So if someone coughs or sneezes, the virus goes onto a surface. How long can it stay on that surface for, therefore be picked up by your hands to get into your mouth is the question. Now, this study was done when there was, um, when the SARS was around in 2010. And the first thing to say, I think, is that the coronaviruses are, are um, enveloped viruses. So what we have is that there's a strand of uh, RNA inside the virus, single strand of RNA. And then surrounding that, we have this protein uh, capsid. 
that surrounds the the virus that's the protein coat but then surrounding uh, surrounding that we have like a, a membrane very similar to the membranes around ordinary cells uh, a lipid bilayer membrane now what happens is that these viruses um, these viruses form inside cells so that th there's a cell an ordinary body cell in your body say and the viruses get into the cell and the viruses reproduce in the cell by genetic uh, hijack hijacking the cell's genetic apparatus and then they bud out the surface they go to the surface and as they bud out the surface if we looked at the surface cell membrane like that if that's the surface cell membrane which is a this bilayer like that and, and here, here's the virus coming to the surface with its RNA and its capsid protein capsid as they go out what they do is they they sort of steal some of the membrane and a bit of this membrane so this membrane here this that purple line would now be with that line there and so they're uh, enveloped in this envelope outer membrane this lipid bilayer membrane and we call this the envelope the viral envelope so they're that they're pathogenic they cause disease but they're enveloped in a, in a membrane um, so they have the RNA, the protein, then the cap that the protein captured, then the outer envelope, which is made of fluid bilayers and, and proteins. You've seen these proteins that stick from the surface of this virus. And that means the fact that there's an envelope means the virus can survive on surfaces for longer. Now, this work was done in 2010, as I say, on SARS. How much it applies to novel coronavirus, we don't know. My suspicion is it would be similar be similar um, so we know that um, that there the coronavirus is, is enveloped in an envelope so it's got this potential to live for longer now this team uh, in applied uh, applied and environmental microbiology 2010 so it's a proper peer-reviewed paper as you would expect on this site um, they use surrogate viruses for SARS now they couldn't use SARS because they would catch it so they used viruses that were similar they were proper virologists they knew what was similar and if anything, they said their estimates were conservative. So if they'd actually been using SARS viruses, they may have survived for longer. And I must say, I was taken aback. Survival time on stainless steel of these viruses, which were the equivalent of SARS viruses, which is very similar to the novel coronavirus, was 5 to 28 days. So the virus could live for 5 to 28 days. Quite incredible. At four degrees centigrade, infectious viral viruses persisted for up to 28 days. So four degrees centigrade uh, in, uh, in low humidity, that they survive for a long time. This is one reason why we have more viral infections over winter. We have the winter flu season. Only this, this year we've got the, uh, the coronavirus season as well, unfortunately. So in cold countries... Um, the spread is going to be easier. Four degrees centigrade on stainless steel, infectious viruses persisted for up to 28 days. I was surprised. I was expecting six, maybe seven at most. But Inactivation was more rapid at 20 degrees than at four degrees. So as it got hotter, the viruses lasted for less time and, in, and they were inactivated more rapidly at 40 degrees than, than, 20, than 20. So when it got, got hotter, the viruses last for long uh, the viruses don't last for as long so as it gets warmer from four degrees up to 40 degrees the amount of time that the viruses can survive on surfaces for goes down but it can still be a day or so here P potentially even two or three days even even in warmer temperatures what the article didn't say was if the virus was destroyed by direct sunlight and i strongly suspect it is but it didn't say that humidity was interesting actually uh, humidity, the virus survived for longer at 20% uh, relative humidity, shorter at 50% and longer at 80% humidity. So uh, the virus didn't seem to like 50% humidity, but it was better at lower and higher humidities. Strange, I, I wouldn't have expected this, but this is what the data says. This is why we do the experiments. If that's what the data says, that's the nearest to truth that we have. So the results show that when high numbers of the virus are deposited, the surrogate may survive for days in typical indoor environments. So I'm assuming 
that the novel coronavirus and the uh, the, uh, the SARS virus can both survive for many days on typical indoor surfaces. So someone could potentially have coughed the virus onto a surface five days ago. You come, touch that surface, you could you could catch it. I'm just going to do another quick uh, another quick couple of things that are vaguely related to that. Then we'll finish for this one. Um, I've had this question so many times. Um, <laughs> am I at risk for novel coronavirus from a package or products from China? Center for Disease Control in Atlanta says there's no evidence uh, and likely low risk. But I did notice they're hedging the bets, likely low risk. They're not saying no risk. So if you're worried about it, I would just delay opening the package for a month or so. Um, it's your choice, of course. But that, that's all I can tell you that, that they're saying no evidence likely low risk so basically the cdc aren't putting the neck on the line on that one so i'm certainly not either can i give my pets uh, the virus or catch it from my pets well again cdc center for disease control says do not handle pets or other animals while sick there's no reports of 2019 novel coronavirus 2 from pets as yet so there's no evidence so far that this virus has gone to pets or been picked up from pets but there again, we have very little data on this virus so far, so that doesn't mean too much. Uh, but we have to say that several types of coronavirus can cause illness in animals and can spread between animals and people. So you now know as much as I do. I, I would say that's a probable, wouldn't you? OK, I'm keeping these videos short. I've had some distribution problems with these videos, so we'll leave that one for now. Um, the next video I want to do, um, I found a paper on who is most at risk of dying if they catch this, if they catch this virus. So that's the next one.